Let's now consider what happens if we have oscillators that are coupled together so they can exchange energy. We'll imagine two mass spring oscillators, one over here with spring constant K0 and mass M1, and here we have spring K2 and mass M2. And at the moment, they oscillate independently, and we know how to solve those equations because we've done that already. But now we add a spring in the middle, which couples the two oscillators together, so energy can be exchanged. Now we need to derive some equations of motion for the variables x1 and x2 to find out how these two masses work. So, start with mass m1. Let's add up the forces. There's one force due to the spring with constant k0. This is as we treated before. And that force is due to Hooke's law. It's in the opposite direction to x1, negative k0 x1. The force due to the spring with constant k1 will be proportional to the difference between x1 and x2. If x1 and x2 move in unison, then this spring stays at its equilibrium position and won't exert any force. So it'll be proportional to the difference between x1 and x2. So let's write it down as k1 x2 minus x1 and check that we've got the sign of this difference correct. So let's imagine now extending x2 so it's really, really enormous. Then this spring will be stretched and pulling mass m1 in the positive direction. And we can see here that the force f1 is proportional to x2 in the right way. That if x2 is large, the force becomes large and positive. And similarly, we can check for how x1 works here. If x1 is really large, then the spring becomes compressed and pushes mass 1 back in the opposite direction. So we have this sign correct. So these are the forces on mass 1. We can add them up to get the total force. And then the total force is mass times acceleration. So we have this equation here. And just collecting terms, multiplying x1 and x2, we have this equation here for mass m1 and the variable x1. Now let's move on to m2. So the force back in this direction is, or the force due to the spring k1, rather, is the equal and opposite of f1. So we can just write down the, the negative of f1. Then the force due to k2 is just again from Hooke's law, negative k2 x2. So writing down equations for m2, similarly, we have so some of the forces equal to this. So mass times acceleration, x2 double dot, must be equal to the sum of those forces. And rearranging to collect the terms in, of x2 and x1. Then these two equations here and here give us a pair of coupled differential equations for the variables x1 and x2, the positions of these two masses. And these are the equations we must figure out how to solve. Let's have a look at the example, an example of this kind of motion. So here I've got some initial conditions and some values for the spring constants. What we can see is in this example, mass M1, the blue one, starts oscillating and then gives its oscillations to the red mass. And then when the red mass is oscillating, it transfers its energy back to the blue mass. So we have some sort of a exchange of energy between these oscillators as anticipated. If we plot this in time, then what we see is that the blue curve, for example, looks like a beat. If you remember a beat in, in between two waves, you have some sort of an envelope with some sort of a frequency underneath it. And this comes as a result of adding two different frequencies together. That's what a beat note is. So it looks as though here, we've got some sort of superposition of two different frequencies in our system. So we anticipate we're looking for a solution that involves two frequencies somehow. How can this be? Well, let's go ahead and solve these equations. So we'll identify these things called the normal, normal modes of oscillation. And this is how we'll do it. So these are our two equations of motion. We'll introduce some symmetry here so that the masses are equal and the spring constants at each end, k0 and k, what was previously k2, these are equal. So now the situation is symmetric about the center of the problem. Writing down these equations again, then we have these two equations. We've eliminated k2 and um, the masses are now equal. Now let's define two new variables, capital XS, which is the sum of x1 and x2, and capital XA, which is the difference between x1 and x2. Now, we're going to add these two equations together. So we add them together, and what we get is that 
the mass times the sum of the accelerations plus k naught times the sum of x1 and x2 must be equal to zero. So here what's happened is that k1 times x2 and k1 times x1 have cancelled. So we can use this definition of xs now to write down an equation that looks like this. And this is an equation for simple harmonic motion as we first encountered it for a single mass and we can solve it. So xs is equal to some amplitude as times e to the i omega s times t plus phi of s. So this is a solution that we've had before. These are the definitions of omega s and the free parameters a and phi are used to fit initial conditions, initial position and initial velocity. So what about if we take the difference between these two equations? Well, taking the difference gives us this equation and again we can identify uh, the difference in the accelerations and difference in position coordinates and substitute xa and come up with an equation for xa and solve it as we did for this case over here. We have a different frequency here now, omega a, which is different to omega s and some two new free parameters we can use to fit initial conditions. So now we have these equations for xs and xa, can we use these to get back to equations for x1 and x2? Well yes we can because xs is defined as this and xa is this. We can solve these equations for x1 and x2 and write them down as a sum and difference of xs and xa divided by 2. So x1 must be given by this and x2 given by this. Where omega s is this frequency, omega a is this frequency, and these are the fitting parameters we use to fit initial conditions for each mass. What are these functions xa and xs that we use to solve this pair of simultaneous differential equations? Let's find out. So x1, we said, could be written as half the sum of xs and xa, and x2 was given by the difference more explicitly like this, we'll find a situation where xa is zero, and that would be the case where this amplitude aa is equal to zero, and there are initial conditions that will achieve that. And so in that case, x1 and x2 are equal and given by a half of xs. So we have x1 equal to this function, and x2 equal to the same function. Same amplitude, same frequency, same phase. The frequency is given by this here. So if we look at this motion, then x1, x2, are in phase with the same amplitude, same phase, same frequency. We call this the symmetric normal mode. Symmetric because the masses are undergoing the same motion. The initial conditions, by the way, that give this symmetric motion are identical initial position and or velocity for these masses. So if you give them ident these masses identical initial conditions, then you get this symmetric mode. So the masses are moving in phase, the amplitudes of the oscillation are the same, the oscillation frequencies are the same, and the symmetric mode situation, what is interesting is that this middle spring plays no role at all, because these masses always have the same distance, and that distance is the initial equilibrium distance. So this spring in the middle is neither compressed nor stretched, and the frequency in fact, the frequency of this motion is just given by root k0 on m, which is the frequency of this single spring over here, and the same single spring over here, because of the symmetry of the situation. So this is the symmetric normal mode. What about xa? So, starting again with the same functions for x1 and x2, we'll find initial conditions such that as this time is equal to zero, and then x1 and x2 are given by plus and minus half xa, like this. So again, we have a mode with the same frequency, same phase, but now the amplitudes are equal and opposite, like this. So this time the masses are oscillating in antiphase, 180 degrees out of phase. The amplitude of the oscillation is the same, however. The amplitude here is a half AA. The oscillation frequency is the same, omega A, which is a little higher than the frequency of omega S because we've got a plus 2K1 here. And so the frequency of the antisymmetric mode is higher because the middle spring is now doing something. The middle spring is active. It's adding some spring constant to the situation, if you like, and so making omega A, the antisymmetric frequency, higher than omega S, the symmetric frequency.